I'm excited about what God has to share with us this morning. And uh, does anybody care to go down memory lane a little bit? It's kind of what we're going to do for uh, part of what I have to share. You know, there's a popular acronym, KISS. Anybody tell me what that stands for? Keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. Now, I know you weren't talking to me, but keep it simple, stupid. I, I uh, looked that up on Wikipedia, where it came from and the history of that acronym. KISS was a design principle noted by the U.S. Navy in 1960. The KISS principle states that most systems work best if they are kept simple rather than made complicated. Therefore, simplicity should be, key, should be a key goal in design and unnecessary complexity should be avoided. Now, I've shared this before, but it fits so well this morning that I want to share it once again. When I was in my late 20s, I was talking to a preacher friend of mine, and I use that term loosely now, but uh, I was talking to a preacher friend of mine, and I don't know what we were talking about, but I, I had made the statement that I said, the biggest compliment I get in my preaching is everybody says I make the Bible understandable. Then I went on to say, I said, well, you know, a simple mind can only teach simply. Now, rather than him to say, oh, no, you're just gifted to take complex, deep revelation and make it simple. No, he just agreed with me. <laughs> so... Uh, I don't like him very much after that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, back when I was in Bible college, uh, one of my professors told a story about how a, an evangelist came to preach. And at the end of his sermon, he was standing at the back of the door, and he was shaking hands as preachers many times do, especially in larger churches. And uh, some lady came up to him and said, that was a wonderful sermon that you preached. But by the way, what does that big word you kept using mean? And the evangelist realized that she didn't know what that word meant. She did not understand any of his sermon. And uh, one of the things that uh, in Bible college that they did teach me was to keep it simple. You know, they, uh, they said basically like, you know, a newspaper. Do you know what grade level a newspaper is written at? Six. Sixth grade. You have six fingers up. A sixth grade reading level. And so I've kind of taken that as my professor suggested. And they would go over a sixth grade level. That way you're pretty sure to get most everybody in the congregation if you keep it at a certain level. So I, I like this KISS acronym. Keep it simple. Amen? And uh, so that's what uh, I want to talk about today. Uh, you know, because we live in a complicated world. It's getting more complicated all the time, amen? Yeah. I mean, if, if, if you're over 40 years old, you almost need a four-year degree to know how to operate a cell phone. <laughs> Most people's smartphones are smarter than they are, amen? Yeah. And it, I mean, when you're under 40, it seems like they just kind of have a knack for it and don't really have a problem. They just pick it up and go. But and if you're over 40, I mean, it, I have a smartphone, and uh, I probably don't use 10% uh, of what's available to me on that phone. And uh, also, uh, I remember when we didn't have voicemail. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Uh, I remember when we had a, an answer machine. And you, when you got home, you would hit play and listen to it, and then you would erase the messages. But I did a little study on this too because I couldn't remember exactly. But answer machines really didn't come out to the public until like the 70s. And even then, a lot of people did not have an answer machine. I remember we had one of those dial, you know, something like that. And, uh, you know, we, I, I don't remember an answer machine being hooked up to that. So if you wanted to get a hold of somebody, you just called and called at home. And when they got home at night, you try to catch them at home or else you didn't talk to them. And uh, so I, I can remember some of these things because I was born in 1960. So, those of us over 50 can remember the 70s 
be in simpler times. Amen? Amen? At least they seem simpler. I don't know what they were, but they sure seemed it. I was talking to Cheryl yesterday about this, and she talked. She said, you know, I can remember my pastor when I was a kid talking about how the 50s were simpler times. <laughs> so it, it's kind of relative to where you're at in life. But it did, it did seem like things were simpler. Automobiles. If you're a mechanic, Tom can tell you, automobiles were much simpler in the 60s and 70s than they are today. I was talking to a guy the other day that had a 1969 Oldsmobile Judge. You know, they called it the Judge. Anybody remember those? They had a 442 in it. And uh, uh, it, was, it was nice. He was filling it up with gas. And, uh, of course, I see a classic car. I, I've never met a stranger that owned a classic car. <laughs> So I had to go, it's a nice car, and I had to look at it, you know, just, I'll tell you, if, 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 if I had a big uh, pole barn, I would just, and, and I had money for investments, instead of putting it in some kind of stock somewhere where you never see it, i just go out and buy a whole lot of uh, classic cars and park them in that pole barn and go out and look at them every once in a while, maybe take them for a drive now, and then enjoy my investment, amen? So I'm trying to set her up here for some reason. Yeah, right. <laughs> I see it going on the road. There's, there's a good investment, honey. <laughs> but the old cars, you didn't have to have computers to work on them. And they didn't have computers in them. They had carburetors and you know, they had some electronics, those points and things of that nature. I mean, I'm not a, a, a mechanic. But, but I do know that when you open the hood, there's like a ton of room. You can get down there and work on them instead of you know being all filled in and no space to get in them. Just a simpler time to, to work on a, on a vehicle. Electronics were simpler. I remember the first video game, and it was called Pong. <laughs> first time I played it were at De uh, Stan and Debbie's house. You know, they, they had all the high tech stuff, they had the color TV. I remember black and white television. I mean, if a neighbor had color TV, we went over to their house to watch TV. <laughs> Anybody else relate? Yeah. I think Cheryl, they had some kind of screen, had blue, some kind of blue, clear, blue, clear, and green. You put it in there, and that was your color TV. <laughs> hey, we had color TV. Uh, I, I can remember that uh, hotels would advertise that they had. TV, air conditioning, and carpet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they were uptown if they had an air conditioning, uh, TV, and carpet. Remember how when we used to get carpet, we said we have wall-to-wall -wall carpet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is all from memory. I didn't find. I tried to find stuff on the internet. I couldn't find it, so I just sit down and I asked Cheryl too some things. <laughs> what were some things we remember back in the day? We only had three channels on television. And at midnight, they would play the national anthem, and then they'd go, shh, <laughs> they'd go off air. To my knowledge, there were no per personal computers back in the early 70s. Uh, I did know of one, uh, was I Dream of Genie? Yes. And it was a computer and it filled a whole room up. What we can probably hold in our hand now, it took a whole room to do the same thing or less, actually. And life always seemed simpler as a kid. All the neighborhood kids would play together. I mean, we would have up to 15 or 20 of us. And, uh, you know, we, we played dodgeball. And, I mean, we, we weren't easy on it either. I mean, we, we tried to hurt each other. Now, I could tell you some other things we did, but I won't do that. But we play hide and seek. Remember that? I mean, it'd be dark. We'd be running around. We played Red Rover. Remember that? Red Rover, Red Rover. Said Michael right over. <laughs> like, which is not politically correct today, but Cowboys and Indians. We would ride our bikes all over the neighborhood and beyond. I'd ride my, I, at 10, 11 years old, I would ride my bike down to the river and go fishing by myself. And it wasn't considered a bad thing. It was just normal to do that. Can you imagine a 10-year-old kid now just, I'm going to go fishing, Mom, and take off on her bike, and 
I mean, it was several miles away, you know, and I'd ride down and go fishing. Uh, I had a paper route when I was 11 years old. And I'd be out collecting money at dark. But it just, nobody thought anything of it at that time. You know, we knew all the neighbors because everybody sat out on the porch because it was hot inside because most people didn't have air conditioning. But I, to this day, I could probably name off every neighbor on my block, every single one of them. I knew them because we'd go out and hang out on their porches and talk to them at night. I remember one time, speaking of bicycles, I went off on my bicycle and I went somewhere I wasn't familiar with and I got lost. And I mean, I pedaled and I pedaled and I pedaled and I pedaled and I pedaled, and I pedaled, and I pedaled for hours, it seemed. And I ended up in Newburgh somewhere. <laughs> now you have to understand, I lived on the south side of Evansville, over south of Riverside and west of 41. And uh, I ended up over in Newburgh and I mean, I was just lost. So I just went up to somebody's house and I just knocked on the door. <laughs> I said, I'm lost, can you help me? And I tried to explain to him where I lived, and he put my bicycle in the trunk, drove me home, and I was embarrassed. I got up by Riverside and Evans, and I said, this is good enough. You know? <laughs> Are you sure? So I got out, and I don't think I ever told my mom about it. <laughs> I just went on. So things are so much different. And, you know, and let me just say this. I'm not against technology. I I'm all for it. But uh, it does seem like it was simpler back in the day. Even church was simpler. Uh, back in the early 80s, I preached at a church in Florida, and it was called Back to Basics. That was the name of the church. Back to Basics. And basically, they were saying, let's simplify church. And, uh, you know, and, and again, I'm, I'm all for, I mean, I love having the overhead projector and, you know, the instruments and, and everything. But I think the, the, the danger is let's not count on things like that. You know, if the power goes off, we ought to still be able to have church. Amen. Amen. Light a candle and sing at the top of your lungs and, and, and preach from the heart. Amen. Amen. I mean, we, we shouldn't count on all the fancy stuff. I mean, some churches, I mean, they would just, I mean, if, if things, what power went out, they, they say, hey, just dismiss and go home. But I can remember in Petersburg, especially, maybe other times, but the power went off and we just, you know, lit some candles around the church and had candlelight service. And it was awesome. I mean, the Spirit of God moved. So let's not count on all the, the technology. Let's count on the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Let's believe the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts. So whenever we think about simplicity, I believe that we as believers might need to apply this to our spiritual lives. That we would get back to the simplicity of Christ. In 2 Corinthians... Uh, chapter 11, verse 3, it reads there, But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now this is not saying that the simplicity of Christ would corrupt our minds, but that our minds would be corrupted from having the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, the NIV translation warns against being led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Let me just say that again. Warns us against being led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. We live in a complicated time. Just watch the news. There is so much going on today, it's unbelievable. There's another saying that says, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Did you catch that? The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And just to give credit, Stephen Covey is the one who said that. Thank you, Stephen Covey. Because that's a good piece of advice, isn't it? The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. So what is that concerning our spiritual lives? What is the main thing? What is it that is important? Well, the warning that Paul gave us is the important thing, and that is sincere and pure devotion to Christ. 
In other words, to be single-minded concerning Christ. That's the main thing. To place Jesus at the center of your life. That's the main thing. If you want to know what's important in this Christian walk, is to say, Jesus, you are at the center of my life. You are the main thing. And I want to keep you the main thing in everything in my life. I feel that many Christians have gotten far away from this. And, and, and the more I look out inside, inside the Christian world, I see it more and more. We fit Jesus in when and where we can fit Him into our busy lives. He's nowhere near center. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 it reads, And He, Jesus, is the head of the body the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. Here's the part I want you to see. So that in everything, everybody say everything. everything. So that in everything, He might have supremacy. So that in everything, He might have supremacy. You know, the question we need to ask is, is Jesus at the center of my life? Does He have supremacy in everything in my life, or is he just a tag on? Is he just another something that I added into my life? I tell you, we'll never live the victorious life if that's the case. If he's if Jesus is just a tag on. If we don't have pure, sincere devotion, if we do not make him central in our life, we'll never have the victory that we could have if we do that. Do we consider His will in the decisions concerning our family? Do we consider His will when we pick our friends? And young people, that is so important. Your friends will have more influence on you than, than you can ever imagine. I mean, I, I want to tell you, I was a teenager that went astray. And up until about 11 years old, I was a sweet kid. But then I got around the wrong people about 12. In 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, I was a mess. Thank God I had a Christian mom that prayed for me and, and uh, never gave up. And you know, and I came back and I got saved at 18. Called the ministry at 19. Been serving the Lord ever since. But that doesn't always happen. But at many times it starts out with who you pick as your friends. So when your mom and dad start nagging you about who you run around with, listen, it's because they love you. Yes. It's important. See, it says, why don't you just back up a moment and pick at your friends. How about your career? Even your career is Jesus at the center. How you serve Him. Are you serving Jesus like He is at the center of your life? About your finances. Are your finances a witness to that Jesus is at the center of your life? You see, it says in everything that He might have supremacy. You know, we say you're worthy, but does our life, the decisions that we make, does that reflect that we really believe He's worthy? You know, it says as we serve Him that, that we are given rewards. It says as we serve Him, we're given a crown. Now, I've used this before and I've heard it somewhere else, um, but I, I just, it's so good I can't improve on it, so therefore you will hear it again. <laughs> but I said, can you imagine? You, you know, I, I mean, I want to serve the Lord so I can have a huge crown. I mean, I want a huge crown. I want to have to have about six to ten people to carry it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, it, because, you know, it says we're going to do with that crown, we're going to throw that at His feet. Yeah. We're going to say, you are worthy. And I want to have six or ten people carry my crown. Because whenever I throw that crown down, I want him to know that I really believe he's worthy. Yeah. And say, you are worthy, Lord. And throw that crown at his feet. Tell you what I don't want to do is walk up with a Burger King paper crown. <laughs> <laughs> you are worthy, Lord. <laughs> you see, we need to make him the center of our life. Sincere and pure. Devotion. Those are not popular words today in the church. When you talk about devotion, being devoted. 
set aside, set apart for His purpose. To say, you are Lord. I serve you because I love you and I so appreciate what you have done for me. My goodness, we have an eternity in heaven because of what Jesus did for us. Because of that, we need to share Christ with others. And when we share Christ with others, when we attempt to share Christ with them, we need to follow this scripture as well, the simplicity that is in Christ. Romans 1.16. It reads there, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. What is the power of God unto salvation? The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. People need a simple presentation of the gospel. And everyone in this room is capable of giving a simple presentation of the gospel. I know we're not all evangelists. I know we're not all going to be door knockers. But we all have family, we have friends, we have people we work with that, that we can take advantage of. That's our mission field. I don't mean take advantage of them, but take advantage of the opportunity to share Christ. That's our mission field. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. People need a simple presentation. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Verses 2 through 4, listen to what it says. By which also you are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received. Now here you go. Here's the gospel, church. That Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now let me back up to what I just said in verse 2. By which you also are saved, if you hold fast to that word, which I... What word did He preach? The word that He preached is that Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. If we hold fast to that, we're saved. That's the Gospel message. He died for us. He rose again for us. The Apostle Paul said, by this gospel you are saved. That gospel has not changed in 2014. It's the exact same gospel. It's ageless. We need to stick to that. Amen? We don't need to add to it. We do not need to take away from it. Don't get fancy. When you're sharing the gospel, do, do not get complex in your efforts to lead people to the salvation of Jesus Christ. Keep it simple. Tell them that Jesus loved them enough to die on a cross for them. He forgave their sins and He rose again from the dead. Paul said that the gospel of Jesus again in Romans 1.16 is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. You know, some have made salvation difficult. But the Bible says Jesus plus nothing. Isn't that awesome? Jesus plus nothing. Paul went around saying salvation is through Christ and Christ alone, but there were people following him around telling new converts, yeah, you're saved through Christ, but now you have to do this. Now you've got to be circumcised. Now you've got to keep the law of Moses. They were called Judaizers. Matter of fact, let's back up. Acts chapter 15, verse 5. And it reads in Acts 15, verse 5, but some of the sect of the Pharisees, but listen, who believed? Okay, these were Pharisees who believed. These were Pharisees that accepted Christ. Rose up, saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now these are folks that believe, but yet they still said, oh, but you still have to do this. 
And we do have our own Judaizers today. Well, it's, it's great that you've accepted Christ, but now, let me tell you what you, you have to do. You have to quit wearing makeup. You can't wear pants. Ladies, you can't cut your hair short. You can't you can't play goldfish. <laughs> can't play Monopoly because it has dice. You can't. Men, you get men, you gotta wear a suit and a tie. I knew one Christian man that he mowed the grass in a white shirt and a tie. It's been a while back. Nothing wrong with wearing a suit and tie. Hey, I put a jacket on today. Didn't quite get to the tie part today. <laughs> Some say, it's great that you accepted Christ, but now you have to be baptized. Now listen, I think you should be baptized. Because that's the first act of obedience. And if you want to have victory in your life, you need to be obedient to Christ. And yes, in 2014, we still need to be obedient. Amen? Yes. Thank God for grace, but the Bible still says that once we're saved, we are to be obedient to the Word of God. Some say, it's great that, that you accepted Christ, but now you, you have to speak in tongues or you're not saved. I think we all should speak in tongues. I'm in good company. Paul says, I wish that you all spoke in tongues. He says, I speak in tongues more than all of you do. But church, you don't have to speak in tongues in order to go to heaven. I think you might be missing out. I could go on. But Paul said, don't listen to him. Paul said, it is by grace we are saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Thank God for his grace. Let me close just by saying this. But now that we are saved, now that we are saved, out of gratitude, we want to serve him. Out of gratitude, we want to make him the center of our life. We understand that He has our best interests at heart. You know, He doesn't tell us to do something or not to do something to give us a hard time. God knows best. Father knows best. Amen? And if we'll listen to His instructions, our quality of life will be much greater than if we don't. Matter of fact, Jesus said, I come that you might have life and that more abundant. He wants us to have an abundant life. And if we'll follow Him, church, we will avoid a lot of heartache. Because He sees the whole picture. We only see dimly. Amen? Amen. So my question this morning is, have you accepted Him today? Have you accepted Him as your Savior? Have you made Him the center of your life by giving Him sincere and pure devotion? If not, today is the day to do so. Amen? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Would you bow your heads with me? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. I want to ask you a simple question concerning a simple gospel. Jesus the Bible tells us, died on a cross, was buried, and He rose again that you might have eternal life. What you need to do is accept that sacrifice He made for you. If you're here this morning and you have never accepted that sacrifice, if you have never invited Jesus Christ into your life, you can do so this very moment. I'm going to ask you to lift your hand and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And you can pray this prayer from your heart, meaning it, believing it. And the Bible says, you shall be saved. So this morning, if that's you, and you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to lift your hand. You can put it right back down. Just lift it up so I can see it. Would there be anybody this morning? You know, I try never to assume everybody knows Christ because... We can sit in a pew or a church chair every Sunday and still not be saved. So one more time, would there be anybody this morning, not asking if you've been coming to church, 
I'm asking you, do you know that if you died right now, you'd be in heaven because you've accepted Christ as your Savior? One last call, would there be anybody? Okay. And I believe this next cause for all of us. Let's just, I mean, I'm, it's not to bring any kind of condemnation or anything of that nature. Let's just search our heart. Are we giving Him our pure and sincere devotion? I think we could all maybe do a little better, amen? And it's not about how good we are, but it's about how good He is and what He deserves, amen? So let's all just take a moment and just thank Him. And in your own way, just tell Him that you want Him to be the center of your life. Sometimes we make it about us, and it should be about Him. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's just let Him know we love Him. Hallelujah. Lord, we love You this morning. You are worthy of our everything, Lord. And we want to put You at the very center of our being. In You we live and move and have our being. And Lord Jesus, we're just sorry for you know, what we made it as, as the song goes. It's all about You, Lord. And Lord, I pray that You would give us strength to make the right decisions every day, every moment. Lord, that we would just have that type of fellowship with You, Lord, that in everything that we do, every decision we make, we would consider Your will and follow Your will. And Lord, we're careful to give You all the praise for enabling us to do that, Lord. We thank You for Your grace that we're able to stand, that we're able to have victory. We know without you we can do nothing, but in you we can do all things. So Lord, we're careful to give you all the praise for what you're doing. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen.